Praise the Lord, friends and brethren. He is worthy. This is Brother Clinton, and you're back on the Word Prophet Channel, a Christian ministry dedicated to the purpose of teaching the Word of God to the people in the churches of God so that we can go back to serving God in spirit and in truth, as Jesus Christ commanded. Praise the Lord. As I was in prayer just a little while ago, I felt the need to turn on the camera to make a video and to minister the Word of God to those many of you who are waiting to see a new video on this channel. So praise the Lord. He gave me something to speak to you about. For those of you who are subscribers, this is going to bless you. For those of you who are not subscribers and, and who have not known me in time past, maybe you're seeing me for the first time, um, I pray that this will be a blessing to you. And if you'd like to hear more teachings like this from the book of Romans, which I'm going to go to right now, there is a playlist on this channel, which is a verse-by-verse -verse study of the letter to the Romans. And I hope that you will take the opportunity to go through the entire playlist, to go through the whole book of Romans with me and see the things that the Lord has given us in his word. Blessed be the name of the Lord. You know, we are so blessed to have this Holy Bible, King James Bible. In English, the King James Bible is the word of God. And many men, many righteous men and women throughout the centuries uh, were martyred, who were killed for the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ so that we could have this Bible in our hands today and so that we could just open it up and read it. And Paul, the apostle of Jesus Christ, who was so filled with the power of God and the wisdom of God, having first been a Pharisee raised up at the feet of Gamaliel and then being converted to the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ and realizing that all he had been taught under the feet of Gamaliel was, well, as he called it, dumb. Today it's called theology. It's useless garbage and nonsense. And he, f he discovered that when he was converted to Jesus Christ. And he was, he, Ananias came to him, laid his hands on him. He received the Holy Ghost and he was baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then spent the next three years seeking the Lord and getting revelation from Jesus Christ personally. And when he met with the other apostles, he discovered, as he already knew, that he had gotten his gospel from the same place that they got theirs and they gave him the right hands of fellowship. And so Paul was an apostle of our Lord Jesus Christ, a very blessed uh, and strong man in the faith, one who had many injuries and marks on his body from the persecutions that he endured, uh, which he spoke about in the second chapter, or pardon me, in the 12th chapter of 2 Corinthians, um, saying that God had told him, my grace is sufficient for thee. Paul the apostle of Christ uh, wrote a great part of the New Testament that we have today, and because of that, because of the ministry that he had, uh, many, many people set themselves against him to persecute him by the, by the spirit of devils. And many people still do today. And you can find uh, a plethora of videos on YouTube by false disciples of Jesus Christ who claim that Paul wasn't an apostle of Jesus Christ and who claim that he was somehow preaching a different gospel than the other apostles and, um, and all kinds of you know, nonsense and gobbledygook and, and, and what they what they say on the on the farm horse hockey concerning um, Paul, the apostle of our Lord Jesus Christ. And it is a great blessing for us to be able to have this letter, the letter to the Romans, all the letters of the New Testament. But uh, I'm speaking specifically of Romans right now because I'm going to share with you a portion from Romans chapter 6. We must realize when we open our Bibles and read this, that this is not just something that we should try to read through because somehow it makes God happy if we read a portion of our Bible every day. This is something that we need. Those of us who are born of this word, we need to feed on this word. And those of, those of you who are born of this word, you know exactly what I mean. And those of you who are not, you don't understand that yet. But if you're born of this word, um, that means that you're born again. Okay? You're born of this word, of the incorruptible seed of the word of God. And if you have this word abiding in you, then you need this word. And when you hear this word preached and taught, as it is written in the scripture, it ministers to you as deep calleth unto deep, and it feeds you. And you will eventually come out of the denominational church that you have been in for years or decades or whatever, because you're realizing that more and more that the bread that they're feeding you from the pulpit is dead. It's dead bread. And you need the living bread, the living bread that came down from heaven. That's what we have in our hands when we have a Holy Bible, King James Version, in our hands. And I say that because there are many different versions of the Bible in English, and the only one that is the Word of God is the, the authorized King James Version of the Bible. If there is any other Bible that is worded differently than this Holy Bible, then it is not the Word of God. 
and it cannot be the Word of God according to the Word of God, because the Word of God says all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for correction, for reproof, and for instruction in righteousness. I've said this many times, and I'll say it again. The only... There is... there is. No, pardon me. Let me back up a second. It is not possible for two Bibles in any given language that say two different things to both be God's Word. Because the Word of God testifies that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto every good work. So if your Bible doesn't say the same thing as my Bible, then they can't both be profitable for correction, or for reproof, or for doctrine, or for instruction in righteousness. So it must be that at least one of them is a lie. If your Bible doesn't say the same thing as my Bible, if my Bible says adultery and your Bible says sexual immorality, or pardon me, if my Bible says fornication and your Bible says sexual immorality, then one of our Bibles is wrong. If my Bible says that the mark of the beast is in the right hand or forehead and your Bible says the, the mark of the beast is on the right hand or forehead, then one of our Bibles is wrong. They're not both the Word of God. If my Bible says fasting and prayer, but your Bible just says prayer, one of our Bibles is wrong. You see? So they can't both be the Word of God if they're not worded the same way. Because every Word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in Him. Therefore, for those of us who speak English, the King James Bible that we've had for over 400 years, translated from the original tongues into the English language, is the Word of God. I'm not here to argue with anybody about that. However, if you have questions and you'd like to learn more, please ask me and I'll be happy to explain. Hallelujah. That said, we are very blessed to have this letter that, that Paul, the Apostle of Christ, wrote to the church at Rome, to the saints at Rome. And as we open this up, it's not just something that we, we just have to read our chapter for the day because it makes God happy if we read our chapter every day. That's, that's not so. Okay? It doesn't make God happy that you read your chapter for the day. Um, we need to read this scripture, those of us who are born of the word of God, because this is the, the, the seed from whence we were begotten, and it is also the pure milk by which we grow. It is something that we need, just like a little baby when he comes forth from his mother's womb. All he knows is mother's teat. That's all he knows. He knows the, little, the shape of the little teat, and he knows what to do with it so he can get milk out of it, and that's all he knows. That's all he wants is milk. Okay, he doesn't want to get a job, he doesn't want good credit, he doesn't he doesn't want a bank account, he doesn't want to just talk. He wants milk because that's what that's what comes from mommy. That's he came from mama and that's the sustenance that also comes from mama. Okay, that's what he needs and this is why the scripture says that we should feed on the pure milk of the word and desire the pure milk of the word. And so this word is not just something that we read as an obligation, a religious obligation to try to please God. It's something that we do because we need it. Because we're born of this seed, the seed that is God's word, and we need this word. And that's why we feed on it. Praise the Lord. So if that ministers to your spirit, then you're here because you desire to grow in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm glad you're here. Because that's why I'm here too. Bless the Lord. So let's open up to Romans chapter 6. And let's just read the first six verses, or seven verses. And may God bless the reading of his word. And I'm going to read this one by one. I'm going to read this you know, verse by verse and stop as I'm going and expound things to you. Praise the Lord. So Paul says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Really? And that's kind of a ridiculous question, but he asked it for a very good reason, because he was just talking about grace. He said in, in, in the, the last verse, that as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Praise the Lord. So how does grace reign? You know, there's a lot of people in the churches that say, I'm under grace. And when they say, I'm under grace, what that means in their mind is that they think that they have obeyed the gospel of Christ when they have not. And that they think that because they haven't obeyed the gospel of Christ and they have no power in their lives to overcome sin, they think that sin is just normal and that you have to sin every day because that's what their pastors tell them. You're going to sin every day which is a lie. If you're a Christian, you don't sin every day. That's ridiculous. Um, but, you know, their, their lying pastors tell them 
they're going to sin every day, and it's okay. They just confess their sins to God every night. Just, you know, God, please forgive me for all the sins I did today. Okay, in Jesus' name, amen. And then they just go to sleep and wake up and do whatever they do, just like the rest of the world all the time. They're not, they're not transformed by the renewing of their minds. They're conformed to this world. They dress like the world. They talk like the world. They act like the world. They do the things that the people of this world do. Because why? They're of this world. And so the Bible says that as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness by Jesus Christ our Lord. How does grace reign? If you're under grace, then how does grace reign over you? Through righteousness. Through righteousness. You see, if you're walking in righteousness, then you're under grace. If you're baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and filled with his spirit, and you're walking according to his word, then you're under grace. As the scripture says, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, then we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ his Son cleanseth us from all sin. This is from 1 John, and it's written to the saints. Okay, Now let me just take a moment to explain something to you, those of you who are not familiar with this ministry. Um, those of you who are familiar with this ministry, you already know what I'm going to say, and I've said it many times, and I'll continue to say it. There are many people in the denominational churches who believe that they have become Christians by accepting Jesus Christ into their heart or accepting Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. Maybe you did that. I did that a long time ago too. I think we were all taught that. I don't know that there's any one of us who was never taught that if you will get on your knees and accept Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, then he will come into your heart, forgive all of your sins, you'll be washed by the blood, and you'll be filled with the Holy Spirit and ready for heaven at that moment. And then they take Romans chapter 10, verse 9 out of context and tell you that if you confess in a church meeting that Jesus Christ is Lord and you, and you believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, that now you're saved. And Romans 10, 9 doesn't say that. And if you want to know more about that, you can ask me and I'll be happy to send you another video that will teach you about Romans 10, 9. But it has nothing to do with, a, with sinners becoming Christians. Romans 10, 9 is about Christians being saved. And it is about the things that Christians do in order to be saved. It's about the difference between the righteousness of faith and the righteousness of the law. Uh, which is to say the difference between the righteousness of a Christian during the New Testament and the righteousness of a Jew during the Old Testament. And the things that the Jews did to be righteous before God under the law of Moses and the things that Christians do to be righteous before God under this time of the New Testament. That's what Romans 10.9 is about. It doesn't have anything to do with sinners becoming Christians. It has to do with Christians being saved from the wrath of God by serving God and walking in the righteousness which is of faith. Praise the Lord. But let's go back to Romans chapter 6. In fact, I backed up to Romans 5.21. We haven't even started Romans chapter 6 yet. <laughs> Welcome to the Word Prophet channel. Well, I'm here to teach you the Word of God. Okay, Not to, not to dance around things and, 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 and you know, just have a 20-minute window for a video and make sure I get it all in in 20 minutes. However long it takes me, that's how long it takes me. You saw when you clicked on this video how long the video is. <clears throat> Pardon me. I don't know how long this video is going to be until I finish it. Praise the Lord. Because I prayed about it right over there and asked God to give me the words. And now that's what he's doing. <clears throat> Pardon me. <clears throat> so, Paul says in Romans chapter 6 verse 1, he says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Those of us who understand the scripture, those of us who are born of the word of God, we understand what a ridiculous question that is. And I'm not calling the word of God ridiculous. It's a rhetorical question on purpose. A rhetorical question is a question that is asked knowing that it is ridiculous, knowing that the answer is obvious, but in order to provoke the hearer to give an answer. Okay? That's what a rhetorical question is. And that's why Paul asked this question. What then? What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Well, of course, the answer to that question is no. Because if you have accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, like I was just beginning to speak about, you haven't obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ. You haven't been saved from your sins. And so, if you haven't been saved from your sins, then you continue to live in sin. And because you continue to live in sin, the pastor that you have been under his ministry, the pastor that you've been following who preached to you the false gospel that you obeyed that didn't save you from anything because it's not the gospel of Jesus Christ has to continue to lie to you 
and tell you that it's okay that you're a sinner still. And you just tell God that you're sorry and everything's going to be all right. Well, that's not how it works, boys and girls, brothers and sisters. Okay, that's not how it works. The apostles of Jesus Christ, from the day that the New Testament began, for those of you who don't know, the New Testament began 50 days after the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, on the day that was called Pentecost. This is written in Leviticus chapter 23, verses 15 through 17, and also is recorded for us in the book of Acts chapter 2. That's when the New Testament began. And when the New Testament began, the apostles of Jesus Christ began to preach, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And this is what Jesus referred to as being born of water and of the Spirit. And so this is the doctrine that the apostles of Jesus Christ got from him, and when the New Testament began, by revelation, they began to preach it. And that's how people became Christians, and that's how people still become Christians. And so if you belong to a church where they have taught you that baptism doesn't save you, um, and they have taught you that you know speaking in tongues doesn't happen anymore, and that was just in the days of the apostles, and, and all the various lies that they make up, my brother and my sister, you need to come out of that, because the Bible doesn't say that. Okay? They tell you that baptism doesn't save you, but the Bible says that it does. The Bible says that baptism is for the remission of your sins, and that it saves you. And, and not in parables either, very clearly. Um, and the Bible says, you know, they say that, that baptism is an outward expression of an inward change, an outward showing of an inward change. That's what they say. That's what I was taught. That's probably what you were taught as well. They say, oh, no, baptism doesn't save you. It's just an outward showing of an inward change. Well, guess what, boys and girls? The Bible doesn't say that. The Bible doesn't say that baptism is an outward showing of an inward change. The Bible doesn't say that baptism is a public profession of your faith. The Bible doesn't say that. Okay. The Bible says that baptism is for the remission of your sins and that it saves you. Praise the Lord. That's what the Bible says. Jesus said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. The apostles preached, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. How did Paul the apostle get saved? Well, he met Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ told him to go to a certain place, and then he called a man named Ananias to go meet Paul, lay his hands on him so that he could receive the Holy Ghost, and baptize him in his name. And Ananias said to Paul, And now why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized, and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. You know, the Bible says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How do we call upon the name of the Lord to be saved? One man told me one time when I asked him that, you just go like this, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And he was serious, but he was greatly confused. Because the Bible says that, we, that, the, that the way that we call upon the name of the Lord to be saved is in baptism. Acts twenty two sixteen. this is how Paul was saved. Ananias said unto him, And now, why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized, and wash away thy sins calling on the name of the Lord. This is the way God has ordained for our sins to be washed away by the blood of Christ when we repent and are baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. This is why John wrote, There are three that bear witness in earth, the Spirit and the water and the blood. And these three agree in one. Because if you have the Spirit and the water, then you have the blood. This is the way that God has ordained it. You and I cannot go to Jerusalem and find the place where Jesus was crucified 2,000 years ago and try to find some of the blood that he shed and, and try to put it on ourselves to cleanse us from our sins. We can't do that. But God has provided a way for us to be washed by the blood of Christ. And I know that many of you, your pastors, have told you that just believe. Just believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. The moment that you believe... You are sealed with the Holy Spirit and you are washed by the blood of Christ and you can't do anything else to be saved. And if you try to do something to be saved, you're adding to the finished work of Christ on the cross. How I abhor that saying. You're adding, adding to the finished work of Christ on the cross. A saying that is not found in the scripture anywhere that was made up by theologians to try to deter people from obeying the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
You know, the Bible says that all those that obey not the gospel of Jesus Christ shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord. And so, if the Bible says that we have to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ, then why is it that there are so many theologians in the pulpits telling people in the churches that there is no gospel to obey? That there is nothing to obey. All you have to do is just believe. Just agree with the fact that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead, that he died for your sins and he rose again, and you're saved. That's what they say. And then many others will say, well, that you know, if you just get on your knees and accept Jesus Christ and confess him as your Lord and Savior, then you're saved. Well, the Bible doesn't say those things. The Bible says that if you will repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, then you will receive remission of your sins and the power of the Holy Ghost. Praise the Lord. No, you don't need to be baptized to get the Holy Ghost. You can receive the Holy Ghost even before you're baptized, just by faith. But you need to be born of water and of the Spirit in order to enter into the kingdom of God. Jesus said that. I didn't make it up. It's written in John chapter 3, verse 5. And it's actually written all throughout the Bible. And this is why Jesus marveled that Nicodemus didn't understand these things. He said, Nicodemus, art thou a master of Israel and knowest not these things? These basic things, the doctrine of baptisms, is one of the principles of the doctrine of Christ. It is one of the most simple, basic things of the doctrine of Christ, and it is taught from Genesis to Revelation. And yet most people in the churches today don't know what the doctrine of baptisms even is. And if you ask most people in the, in the churches today, if they could open up their Bible and teach you about the doctrine of baptisms, they wouldn't have a clue. And I don't say that to slander people. I say that because it's a reality, because we live in the last days when, when a great falling away has begun to happen. And the vast majority of people in the churches today don't know who Jesus Christ is and haven't obeyed the gospel of Christ and don't even know how to obey the gospel of Christ. And therefore, they're still sinners. They're not saints. They're still sinners. Okay, If you obey the gospel of Jesus Christ, then you're not a sinner anymore, my friend. You're a saint. Okay? A saint is a person who has been washed from his sins by the gospel of Christ and been made a partaker of the Holy Spirit of the living God so that he can walk according to the word of God and not live as a sinner anymore. That's what a saint is. All Christians are saints. You see? And it is a fact, according to the scripture, that sinners shall not stand in the congregation of the righteous, that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So if you've been taught that you can remain a sinner and still enter into the kingdom of God, you've been greatly deceived, my friend, because that's not the way it works. You cannot enter, enter into the kingdom of God as a sinner, and you will not enter into the kingdom of God as a sinner. And that's what this passage of the scripture is talking about. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Shall we pretend that the grace of God is what the theologians and the pulpits tell us that it is so that we can reject the gospel of Jesus Christ and obey a false gospel that didn't save us and then continue to live as sinners and imagine that we're going to inherit the kingdom of God because we're under the grace of God and he understands that we're sinners and it's okay? No, my friends. No, it doesn't work that way. You see, many people think that because they haven't obeyed the gospel of Christ and they're still sinners, that they can't help sinning, they don't know what it is to be a saint. They don't even know that it's possible to be a saint, to be saved from their sins. They imagine that because they, they continue to live in sin, that God just forgives them for their sin. And that one day, when the resurrection happens, then they'll just wake up in glory and then they won't be sinners anymore. It doesn't work that way. You see, you're not going to wake up in the resurrection unto eternal life if you haven't been converted in this life from a sinner into a saint and lived holy. Because the Bible says without holiness no man shall see the Lord. You see, if you're not holy today then you're not going to wake up in glory tomorrow. If you're not holy today you're going to wake up in the fire of hell because that's where sinners go when they die. You see, when sinners give up the ghost they go to hell it doesn't matter if they thought they were Christians their whole life or not. They go to hell, the fire of hell, wherein they are sealed forever and ever. There is no purgatory. It's not for a certain amount of time. And, and there's no, there's no, the, the doctrine of annihilism is, is a lie. 
Okay, those of you who believe that, you know, the, the, I think it's Jehovah's Witness doctrine, or I think it's also taught in the Worldwide Church of God with Herbert Armstrong, um, that this, this doctrine called annihilism, that, you know, they can't, um, they can't fathom the reality of the Word of God and the eternal judgment of, of the Lord. And eternal judgment is another one of the principles of the doctrine of Jesus Christ. Eternal judgment. Um, just those two words explains what it is. You don't even have to study any more about it to know what it is. It's eternal and it's judgment. Okay, Eternal means that it lasts forever. And judgment means that it's the punishment from God. Eternal judgment. And there are people that teach that, you know, when, when we when the wicked die, they don't they, they don't burn forever, they just burn up. They just burn for a minute or so or a couple seconds or whatever, however long they imagine that it is, and then they just cease to exist anymore. That's a lie. That's a lie. The Bible says that the smoke of their torment shall ascend forever and ever. That's reality. So that's the, the fate of sinners. If you're a sinner, it doesn't matter if you call yourself a Christian or not. If you're not a saint, if you're not saved from your sins so that you're not a sinner anymore, then you're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. You see, because the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So if someone has told you that you're righteous while at the same time you're not living righteously, that's a deception. That's a deception. Because... The Bible says that even a little child is known by his doings, whether his works be righteous or whether they be evil. Okay, You can tell even, even a little child knows the difference between right and wrong. So if you're doing things that are wrong, and you know that they're wrong, because the Word of God says that they're wrong, and the Word of God is written in your heart. Even if you're not a Christian, the law of God is written in your heart. You know it's wrong to steal, to kill, to lie, to commit adultery, to fornicate. You know that those things are wrong, even if you've never read a Bible, because those things are written in your heart. That's why you do those things in secret, because you don't want to get caught, because you know that they're wrong. And people that do those things are not going to inherit the kingdom of God. They're going to inherit the fire forever, the lake of fire. And so, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Of course not. Obviously not. Yes, those of us who are saved from our sins, we are under grace. The grace of God, who has saved us from our sins and enabled us to live after the manner that he has commanded us in his word. And how do we do that? By our own just getting our stuff together? We just decided one day we we're going to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps and start living holy? No, of course not. We didn't have the power to do that. Okay? That's why I use the phrase pulling yourself up by your bootstraps. That, that's an impossibility. You can't pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. Okay? Neither can a man change his heart neither can a leopard cha a leper change his a leopard change his spots neither can an ethiopian change his skin okay neither can a man change his heart but the lord the almighty god is able to change the heart of a man and by the gospel of christ he is able to do that and affect that change so if you've been born of the word of god and then you obey the gospel of jesus christ you're no longer a sinner my friend you're a saint now, does that mean you can't sin anymore? No, it doesn't mean that. You still have the flesh. You still have the lust of the flesh. You still have temptation all around you. But the difference is that you're not a sinner anymore. You're not a slave to sin anymore. So that you can tell sin no. So that you can say um, that, that I am alive unto, I am dead unto sin and alive unto God through Jesus Christ my Lord. And so that you can say to sin, no, I reject you in the name of Jesus Christ and I have the power to live right according to the gospel of Jesus Christ. When you have a temptation to steal, you can now say, It is written, Thou shalt not steal. I am dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ my Lord. And then you go on. Praise the Lord. You see, instead of when you're a sinner, you have a thought to steal, and you just steal. Because that's just what you do. And then since you're a churchgoer, you just you know get on your knees at the end of the day and say, Please God, forgive me for stealing from that man. And you think that you're forgiven, but you're not. Because you haven't obeyed the gospel of Christ. You're still a sinner. You see? <clears throat> Praise the Lord. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Now notice the word we here in verse 2. Who is the word we referring to? 
it's not referring to, it doesn't include you if you're a theologian. It doesn't include you if you're a Baptist or if you're a Lutheran or if you're a Pentecostal or if you're a Catholic or if you're a Jehovah's Witness or if you're a Mormon or if you're in whatever other denomination that you might belong to. It doesn't include you. We includes the saints. Come with me back to the first chapter of this letter. Romans chapter 1, verse 7. To all that, this is to who this letter was written, to whom this letter was written. To all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. This is who this letter is written to. So whenever we see the word we in this letter, we know that it includes those that are called to be saints. Those who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. Now, of course, you and I are not in Rome, but those of us who are in Jesus Christ, beloved of God and called to be saints, we can take this letter as written to us as well. And so the word we refers to the saints. It refers to those who are baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of our sins, filled with the Holy Ghost, which is the Spirit of Jesus Christ in us, the hope of glory, and walking in His Word. Walking in His Word. Walking in obedience to His Word. Fearing God and walking in obedience to His Word. And abstaining from things that are sinful because we know that those things are displeasing to our God and that they bring death. That, that's who the we is referring to. See? So he says, How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Now this word we is also specifically referring to people that are baptized in the name of the Lord. Although everybody that, that received this letter in the beginning was baptized in the name of the Lord. That's who Paul wrote the letter to. But we can see by the, by the, the, the succeeding verses that we're about to read that Paul is, is getting ready to talk to the church about the fact that we were buried with Christ in baptism. That's what he's talking about. And it's obvious as, as we go on, for those of you who are theologians, you may not agree with this, but it remains true nonetheless, that the baptism that Paul is talking about here in this chapter is a literal baptism in water, being dunked under water, calling on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what this is talking about. Okay, There can't be any other thing that it is talking about. It's obvious. And so, if you have eyes to see, you will see. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? How are we dead to sin? Just by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, and now all of a sudden we're dead to sin? No. How were we buried? How were we buried if all we did was believe on the Lord Jesus Christ? How were we buried? Well, a man can't be risen from the dead unless he is first dead and buried. Right? You can't just be walking down the street someday and then, and then all of a sudden just be risen from the dead. Why? Because you haven't died. Could our Lord Jesus Christ have been risen from the dead if he had refused to die? No, of course not. I mean, that's kind of a, a ridiculous question. Another rhetorical question, just like when Paul said, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Obviously, the answer to that is no. And so if I ask you, could our Lord Jesus Christ have been risen from the dead if he hadn't first died? The obvious answer to that question is no. He had to die. And he himself said, Except a corn of wheat be planted into the ground, it abideth alone. But if it be planted, but if it die, then it bring forth much fruit. And he was a force speaking of himself. And he said in another place, I have a baptism to be baptized with. <clears throat> and how am I straightened until it be accomplished? In the 12th chapter of Luke, somewhere around the 50th verse, he said that. And he was talking about his baptism into death. He was talking about, are you paying attention? He was talking about his baptism into death. He was about to be submerged into death for you and me. And so the way that we come into Jesus Christ by the gospel that he ordained to be preached by his holy apostles is to also be baptized in water. Okay? It is a baptism of water and spirit. That's what the New Testament baptism is. There is one Lord, one faith, and one baptism in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. The one Lord is Jesus Christ. The one faith is the faith that we believe that the, that the apostles preached. The faith means the doctrine, the teaching. Okay, The apostles' doctrine, that is the faith. The one faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. In the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. One Lord, who is Jesus Christ. One faith, which is the doctrine of the apostles. And one baptism which is a baptism of water and spirit, just as the Lord said, except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. This was typed out throughout all the Old Testament, 
through the flood in the days of Noah, as Peter explained in 1 Peter chapter 3, in the, at the Red Sea, when the children of Israel crossed the Red Sea, as Paul explained in the New Testament in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, that those two things were baptisms. We have also the baptism of Naaman in 2 Kings chapter 5. We have also in, in uh, Leviticus chapter 14, I believe, the washing, uh, the cleansing of lepers, those who were cleansed from their leprosy and the ritual that the priests were commanded to do with two birds, one bird over uh, killing one bird over running water and then dipping the other bird in the water with the blood and setting the bird free. This is why Jesus told ten lepers, Go and show yourselves unto the priests for a testimony unto them. And as they were going, they were cleansed. Why did Jesus say that? So that they would go to the priests, and the priests would do the, the, the ritual that God commanded them in Leviticus chapter 14 as a testimony to them of the fact that their Messiah was there, and that a few days later, when, he would, when the New Testament would begin, this is the way of salvation. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. Be baptized, because in the water, when you call upon the name of Jesus Christ, the blood is there. The blood is there. The water is just water. But when you are baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, the blood is there. The blood of the dead bird is in the water. And when the living bird is dunked into the water, he's dunked into the blood of the dead bird, and then he is set free. Praise the Lord. Read Leviticus chapter 14 for yourselves and see what I'm talking about. The doctrine of baptism goes all the way through the scripture. And so in order for a person to be raised from the dead, two things must happen first. First, he must be dead, and then he must be buried. Okay, Because a person can't be raised unless he is in the lower parts first. To be raised means that you're taken from something lower and raised up. Okay, If you're already here and then you wind up here, you're, you haven't been raised. Okay? But if you're here, and then you wind up here, then you've been raised. Because raised means to be taken up from a lower place to a higher place. Okay? That's what the English word raised means. It's perfectly simple. And so you can't be risen, raised or risen from the dead unless you have been first buried. And how are we buried? Well, we're buried with Christ in baptism, but only if we die. What are you talking about, Brother Clinton? Paul is going to explain. Verse 3, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Okay. Now, here's that word us again. Well, it was we earlier, but now it's us. It's the same thing. Know ye not that so many of us, because you wouldn't say so many of we, but you know, it's, it's, this is proper English. So many of us, it's a, it's a personal pronoun, uh, plural, that refers to us, ourselves. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Paul says this to the church at Rome. You all were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't you understand that when you were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, you were baptized unto his death? This means that you died to yourselves. This means that you, whatever your name is, say your name is Steve. Okay, Steve died to himself. Steve decided not to live for Steve anymore. Steve decided to live for Jesus Christ. Steve decided to stop doing things Steve's way and start doing things Jesus' way. The way. Because Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And the way is narrow. So Steve recognized that and he understood that he needed to stop living Steve's way and start reading the words of Jesus Christ and live Jesus' way. And when Steve did that, Steve died. Steve was no longer living for Steve. Steve decided to live for Jesus. And so when Steve died, then he needed to be buried. And how was he buried? He was buried with Christ in baptism. That's how Steve was buried. And now he can be risen from the dead. Now he can be risen because he's been dead and buried. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ died and was buried, and the third day he rose again from the dead. And he sent forth his apostles to preach in his name the remission of sins. And how do we do that? How do we obey the gospel of Christ? The apostles preached, repent. That's how you die. Repent. Stop living for yourself. Start obeying God. Turn from your evil ways and start doing that which is right and good according to what God says. 
That's repent. That's what repentance means. Repentance means when you're walking one way and you turn around and start going the other way. That's what repentance means. So repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Why should you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ? For the remission of sins. Okay? Not because you already received the remission of your sins, like some confused scholars will try to tell you, for the remission of your sins. What is baptism for? It's for the remission of your sins. It's how you are saved. All, whosoever believeth and is baptized shall be saved. According to, his, according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Okay, the washing of regeneration. Uh-oh, Brother Clinton, are you saying, are you talking about baptismal regeneration? Yeah, I am, in fact, because that's what Paul the Apostle of Christ said. Regeneration comes when you are baptized in the name of Jesus Christ and you receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. According to his mercy, I'm quoting from Titus chapter 3, verse 5, a letter from Paul the Apostle to Titus, a bishop. Um, according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. Okay? The washing of regeneration is not a spiritual thing by the Holy Ghost because he said also, and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. So the washing of regeneration is something different than the renewing of the Holy Ghost. It's not the same thing. If it were the same thing, it wouldn't be separated by the conjunction, and. When you put and in between two things, it means that they're two things. And. It separates the first thing from the second thing. According to his mercy, God's mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. This is what the Bible says over and over and over and over and over and over and over. So the way that we are buried in the gospel, according to the gospel of Christ is to be baptized into Jesus Christ. And when we are baptized into Jesus Christ, we are baptized into his death. Verse 3 again, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore, therefore, and as I've said many times, when you see this word therefore, pay attention to what it's there for. Because it's talking about something that was just said. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death. Into death. We are buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead, raised up from the dead, the dead is down here, raised up is up here. Okay, That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Newness of life. Now, my friends and my brethren, you don't get newness of life from the Baptist Church, or from the, th from the Lutheran Church, or from the Mormon Church, or from the Jehovah's Witnesses, or from the Catholics. Why? Because they don't preach the gospel of Christ. They don't tell you the way of salvation in Jesus Christ. So you haven't been buried with Christ. You haven't been baptized into Jesus' death. Therefore, you can't be raised from the dead. You can't be raised from the dead unless you're dead and buried. That's just a plain and simple fact. Why is Paul talking about all this? Because he said, Shall we then continue in sin that grace may abound? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized were baptized into his death? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we also should walk in newness of life. This is why John said in 1 John, He that saith, I know him, ought himself also so to walk even as he walked. And so many of you will say to me, Well, Brother Clinton, nobody's perfect. We can't be perfect. That's a lie. You can be perfect. In fact, if you're not perfect, you're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. That's what the Bible says. Did you know that? Come with me to the Proverbs chapter 2. Proverbs chapter 2. The 
the last couple verses. It says, For the upright shall dwell in the land, and the perfect shall remain in it. But the wicked shall be cut off from the earth, and the transgressors shall be rooted out of it. So what's the difference between the perfect and the wicked? What's the difference between the upright and the transgressors? Well, it's contained in the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the difference between being a sinner, having obeyed a false gospel, or having believed a false gospel and remaining a sinner, and having believed the true gospel and obeying it and becoming a saint. That's the difference, you see. If you're in Jesus Christ, then you walk like Jesus Christ. You talk like Jesus Christ. You act like Jesus Christ. Okay? It's not just because you're trying to imitate him. It's because you're in him. He's in you. You're his disciple. You read his word. You believe his word. You do what he says. So you become like him. And in so much that when you become like him and walk like him, then you will, when you, when you give up the ghost, you will inherit his kingdom. And in that time when you inherit his kingdom, you shall see him as he is, and therefore you shall be like him. That's the hope. That's the blessed hope that we have as Christians. John said in 1 John chapter 3, Beloved, now are we the sons of God. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. You see, if you have this hope in you, then you are purifying yourself even as he is pure. How are you purifying yourself? By abiding in his word. Jesus said in John 17, 17, when he was praying unto his God and our God, his Father and our Father, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. How are we sanctified, boys and girls? By abiding in the word of God, by doing what we're doing right now. See, this is how we read the word. We don't just open up and read a chapter and for five minutes and say, okay, whew, I read my chapter for the day. Now what's for breakfast? Let me feed my belly. Let me do what I want to do. It's not what it's about. It's not about here. It's about home. It's about living for the kingdom of God. It's about living for Jesus Christ. And yes, we have things that we need here. We need food. We need clothes. We need shelter. And as we seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, guess what? All these things shall be added unto us. So we don't need to strive for the things that are passing away. We need to strive for the things that are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. And when we do that, everything that we have need of here will be given to us. And that's what it means to die with, with Christ and be, and be raised with him in newness of life. Newness of life. You have a new nature. You are a new creature. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. What does this mean? It means what it says. It doesn't mean that if you're married, that now you're not married anymore. You're free to marry someone else, like some people like to try to, to, uh, to state. Uh, no, if you're, if you're born, if you're in Jesus Christ, You've been baptized in his name and you're filled with his spirit. That doesn't mean that your, your wife isn't still your wife anymore. Um, it doesn't mean that if you owed somebody $100 yesterday that you don't still owe them $100 today. Because you do. Okay? It doesn't mean if you took out a loan from a bank yesterday and, and now you're in Christ, now you don't have to pay the loan back. Because you do. See? It doesn't mean that, you, that, that your debts are gone. It doesn't mean that your marriage is absolved. What it means is that your sins are washed away and that the nature that you had before as a sinner that you inherited from Adam is now has now been exchanged for your new nature, the nature of God which is in you, Jesus Christ. And you're no longer a child of Adam. You, are, you have been translated from the, from the line of Adam into the family of God and given the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. See, if God is your father, then Adam is no longer your father. If you're still a son of Adam, then God is not your father. How do you know the difference? Well, if you're still a sinner, if you haven't obeyed the gospel of Christ, then you're still a sinner, and you're still a son of Adam, and you're under the curse. You're under the law. You're not under grace. Okay, You're not under grace until you have obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ, and you are living in righteousness, because grace reigns through righteousness. Praise the Lord. Let's go on. Verse 5. For if we have been planted together 
in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Now again, here's the word for in the beginning of the verse, but it's the same as the word therefore. It means the same thing. So when you see this word for, consider what it's there for because it's talking about something that was just said. It's continuing the same thought. So the word for is, is to say, because of the things that were just said, continuing this same thought, okay? For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, now let's think about this for a moment. When, when many of us were in time past, we, were, we went to a church and we were taught that if we just accept Jesus Christ as our personal Lord, and so this is what, what Billy Graham taught for decades, lying to people for decades on purpose as a Jesuit, lying to people on purpose, deceiving people for the Pope on purpose. And he said this to people for decades and generations. He, he told people about the Word of God and about sin and about righteousness. And that's all true and that's wonderful. And he told people that Jesus Christ was risen from the dead. And that's true and that's wonderful as well. Praise the Lord. But then he stopped there. And he purposely hid the gospel of Jesus Christ from people and told them when they were convicted of their sins, told them that if they would just right now make a decision for Christ, that they would be covered by the blood of Christ and, the, and that if they were to die at this very moment that they would die and go to heaven, that they would inherit the kingdom of God. And that's a lie. That's a lie. Because they haven't been planted together in the likeness of his death. And so they can't be in the likeness of his resurrection. When Jesus Christ, and when, when our Lord Jesus Christ knew that it was time for him to give up the ghost, time for him to be persecuted unto death, he went out into the garden and he prayed. He prayed to his father and he said, Father, if it be possible, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. And you know what he said next? He said, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. He loved his father. He loved his God. He served his God to the end and the end became the beginning. Hallelujah. And so, we are to become conformable unto his death. We are to say to God as well, in every area of our life, pardon me, in every area of our lives, not my will, but thine be done. We are not to say to God, okay, I want this and I want this and I want that and I claim this and I claim this and, you know, God has made me rich and, you know, rich in the things of this world and look at how much God has blessed me. Look at my Rolls Royce and I have one for every day of the week and look at my mansion. See how God has blessed me? My friend, that's not a blessing from God. That's a blessing from your God, the devil, because your God is your belly and your glory is in your shame. Now, that's not to say that God won't prosper you because he will. He'll give you everything that you have need of in this life. Okay, But if what you want is fame and wealth and to be filthy rich, then the devil is happy to give you that. God won't give you that because he knows that you don't need that. He knows that that will destroy you because you ask a misc that you might consume it upon your lusts. And so, but God will give you the things that you have need of. But here's the point. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. You see, when you in that church meeting, when you cried little alligator tears and you accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, you hadn't died. Okay. Now, I did that too a long time ago. Back in 1994 that happened to me and I was born again that day. And maybe you were too, but I wasn't a Christian yet, okay? I was born again. I was born again for almost five years until I became a Christian, until I got saved from my sins. And because you're born again, you have a change in your life and you desire to do that which is right, and that's awesome. And so you abstain from that which is evil, and you, and you delight in that which is good and right. You abide in the Word of God, and you do that which is right, and you abstain from that which God has commanded you not to do. That's awesome. That's death. Now you need to be buried. You see? Now you need to be buried. Because if you can't if you if you're not buried, if you're not under, then you can't be raised up. You see? You have to be buried so that you can be raised up. Jesus Christ descended into the lower parts of the earth and then ascended up into the highest part of heaven, so that now he is Lord of all. Hallelujah. Glory to his name. And so if you want to be raised up, then you have to be buried. Praise the Lord. Now, you may have already received the Holy Ghost. I received the Holy Ghost before I was buried too. You see, it's not about which order it happens in. It's about completing the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's about the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, 
and raised up again in newness of life. Well, what, what are you talking about, Clint? Why are you making that up? I'm not making that up. It's written in Colossians chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. The circumcision of Christ is to be buried with him in baptism and risen up in newness of life according to the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. You see? So in verse 5, Romans 6, 5, it says, For if we have been planted together, if, for if, if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. If we have been dead and buried in his name, in the likeness of his death, then we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. As I quoted to you from 1 John chapter 3 earlier, my, my, he said, My little children, um, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when we shall see him, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Praise God. So you're not going to be a partaker of the resurrection, the literal bodily resurrection, the resurrection of your body, standing in glory with Jesus Christ in his kingdom. You're not going to be a partaker of that unless you have been properly buried, planted, Okay, what does it mean to plant? It means to bury a seed. And what happens when you bury a seed? Well, if it's a good seed and you water it, then the husk of that seed dies and falls away and, 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 and goes back to the, to the soil. And the inner part of that seed, that which God has placed in the middle, grows. And it becomes a tree or a plant or whatever it is, that, that whatever kind of seed that it is. Praise the Lord. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. It just makes perfect sense. Praise the Lord. Knowing this, verse 6, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now come with me to the seventh chapter, verse 4, real quick. I want to share this with you. Romans 7, 4. He says, Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who was raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. This is what Paul's talking about. See, the body of Christ, the body. Now, the body of Christ can be used in two different ways. The body of Christ can be used to refer to those of us who are his church, purchased by his blood, baptized in his name, filled with his spirit, walking in his commandments. We are the body of Christ, and he is our exalted head. But in this particular case, in these both of these cases, Romans chapter 6, verse 6, and Romans chapter 7, verse 4, the body of Christ is being used in a different way. It's talking about the physical body of our Lord Jesus Christ. The body that he walked in. The body that he was born in. And that body was crucified. It was crucified. Jesus Christ was crucified. The body of Christ was nailed to a cross. Glory to his name. And he did that for us. That body that was crucified on that cross has now become our body if we have died and been planted together in the likeness of his death. If we have died to ourselves and been buried in Jesus' name, then that body has become our body. And guess what? When sickness comes to this body, I can just take it and I can put it in that body that was crucified on the cross for me. Because the Bible says, with his stripes we are healed. And when the enemy comes to me, uh, declaring to me my past sins, well, you did this and you did that. I can say, you know what, devil? All that's true and much more. But that's not in this body anymore. It's on that body. The body of Christ. It's nailed to the cross. You see? It's been dealt with. It's crucified. That's how we are dead to the law by the body of Christ. 
Because if we're in Jesus Christ, if we're baptized in his name and filled with his spirit and walking according to his word, <coughs> pardon me, then we're not under the law anymore. Because the one who gave the law is in us and we're walking according to his leading, thereby we are fulfilling the law and no longer under the law and therefore we are under grace. But my friends and my brethren, if you are walking in sin, if you're living in sin, you're not under grace. If you're a sinner, you're not under grace. You're under the law. I don't care what your pastor told you, my friend. You're not under the grace of God if you're living in sin. If you're still a sinner, if you haven't been saved from your sins, and you say, well, Brother Clinton, I've been saved. I was saved when I was seven years old. I accepted Jesus Christ when I was seven. And I spoke with other tongues. Hey, well, praise the Lord. That's awesome. But you weren't saved because you didn't obey the gospel of Christ. And if you haven't been saved from your sins, then you can't inherit the kingdom of God. And if you're still a sinner, if you come to me and say, Brother Clinton, you think you're so special, but we're all sinners. No, my friend, we're not all sinners. Some of us are sinners and some of us are saints. And I don't say that in pride. It's by the grace of God that I am what I am. For it's by the grace of God that I've been saved through faith. And even that faith is not of myself. It is, it is, it's a gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. But my friend, if you are still a sinner and you tell me at the same time that you are saved, then I would ask you, what are you saved from? And you'll say, well, I'm saved from hell. No, you're not. Who told you that you were saved from hell? The Bible doesn't say that you've been saved from hell. The Bible says to the saints that we've been delivered from the power of darkness. The Bible doesn't say we've been saved from hell. The Bible says we've been saved from the power of darkness so that we can live right. And if we live right, and if we walk according to the word of God, and if we live in holiness and forsake sin and walk in a way that is perfect, even as Jesus Christ our Lord walked, and he's in us, so we're walking in him by his leading, then, then we shall be saved from hell. And that's what Romans 10.9 is talking about, my friends. If we walk in Jesus Christ and confess his name with our mouths and continue in the faith of his resurrection, keeping ourselves unspotted from the world, then we shall be saved. See, Romans 10, 9 doesn't say if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, then you are saved. It says, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved shalt be. That's in the future. And this is a letter to Christians. Okay, Why would Paul tell Christians that they shall be saved in the future if they confess with their mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in their heart that God hath raised him from the dead? That's because that's what Christians are supposed to do. Confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and continue in the faith of his resurrection. If you read the 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians, you will see that Paul spent an awfully long time writing to the Corinthian church about the fact that there were some people among them that were preaching that there was no more resurrection. And Paul was like, what? What? Are you guys serious? If Jesus is, if, if, if there is no more resurrection, then Jesus isn't risen from the dead. And if Jesus isn't risen from the dead, then you're all lost in your sins and there is no hope for you. How can you all say that there is no resurrection? <clears throat> that the resurrection is past already. You see, you have to continue in the faith of the resurrection of Jesus Christ in order to attain to the resurrection from the dead. And if you stop believing in the resurrection, then you're not going to be resurrected. Boys and girls, it's just that simple. And so Paul wrote to us as Christians that if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus, why? So other people can hear about him. And Believe in our heart that God hath raised him from the dead so that we also can be raised from the dead. Then we shall be saved. For with the, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. With the, heart, we, we believe, with the heart man believes unto righteousness. And with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And so those of us who confess the Lord Jesus Christ and continue in the faith of his resurrection, we shall be saved. Those of us, when I say those of us, I'm talking about those of us who have obeyed the gospel of Christ. <clears throat> and we confess the Lord Jesus Christ with our mouths. 
You see, because Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I will confess you also before my Father. But there's no such thing as a quiet Christian. If you're not confessing Jesus Christ, then you're not going to enter into the kingdom of God. If you're not telling people about Jesus Christ, then Jesus Christ, when he sees you, he's going to be ashamed of you and he's not going to confess your name before his Father. That's what Romans 10.9 is talking about. And so, if we, as we go back to Romans chapter 6, verse verse 6, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him. Our old man. The old man. The old man was a sinner. See, if you're still a sinner, then you're still living in what Paul calls the old man, and you don't know the new man yet. You haven't got a new man yet. And if you don't have a new man yet, you're not going to enter into the kingdom of God because the old man can't enter into the kingdom of God. Therefore, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed. The body of sin has to be destroyed. You can't remain a sinner and enter into the kingdom of God. You can't do it. It's not going to happen. I don't care what your pastor told you. I don't care how many years he spent in seminary. I don't care how many languages he speaks. The unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Sinners shall not stand in the congregation of the righteous. It's not going to happen. If you're a sinner, you're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. You're not going to stand in glory. <coughs> Pardon me. In, in the kingdom of the Almighty God, beholding Him in His glory, walking on golden streets beside the river of life with the rest of the saints and the angels, if you're a sinner. And that's why Jesus Christ came and did what He did he laid down his life and was buried and raised from the dead and sent forth his apostles to preach that we could have life through his name so that we could be changed from sinners into saints so that we could experience the miracle of the gospel of Christ as Naaman the Syrian leper was told to dip himself in the Jordan River seven times. And, Na and Naaman said, well, I have rivers in my own country. You mean to tell me I walked all the way here to, the, to another country? To be told that if I dip myself in the water, I'm going to be made clean? He said, that's ridiculous. And his servant besought him to do so. He said, you're already here. Why not just do it? And so Naaman went down into the river, into the Jordan River, seven times, dipped himself in the river, and what happened? He wasn't a leper anymore. His leprosy was gone, boys and girls. He didn't have leprosy anymore. He was healed. Why? Was it because the water in the Jordan River was better than the river Farpar in his country, Syria? No, I think not. It was because he did what God told him to do. And when he did what God told him to do, God healed his body. So when you go to get baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, is the water that you're getting baptized in, does that water have power to save you? No, it's just water. It's just water. If it's in a lake, you know, fishes use it to swim in. Fishes even go to the bathroom in it. Okay? It's, pardon me for saying so, but I mean, that's, the, that's an ecological reality. Okay? It's just water. You can use it to bathe in. You can use it to wash your clothes. You can use it to wash your dishes. It's just water. But when you do what God says to do, then you are healed then you are buried with Christ in baptism. Then you have an old man which is dead that the body of sin might be destroyed so that body of sin becomes nailed to the cross with Jesus Christ in his body and you are given a new body, a new nature. Okay, now I'm not saying, I'm not talking about the resurrection, that's going to happen in the future, but there is a spiritual body and there is a natural body. This is written in the scripture. You have a spiritual body and you have a natural body. Your spiritual body is the one that is inside of you that no one can see. And it becomes manifest by your natural body. Your spiritual body, when you were born, you were born after the image of Adam. And I was too. All of us were. There's only one man that has ever existed on the face of the earth that wasn't born after the image of Adam. And that is the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. Because his father wasn't Joseph. His father was God. And so he didn't come from the line of Adam. He came from God. He, this is the generation of Jesus Christ. And if you're in him, then you are of the generation of Jesus Christ as well, which is the first line of the gospel 
according to Matthew, the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of Abraham, the son of David. Praise the Lord. And so, back to Romans chapter 6, verse 6, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, so that you are no longer a sinner. You are now a saint. You are in Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ is in you. He will fill you with his Spirit, and that's how he is in you. And you've been baptized in his name. That's how you're in him. If you haven't been baptized into the name of Jesus Christ, then you're not in Jesus Christ. And again, I don't care what your pastor told you. If you haven't been baptized into Jesus Christ, then you're not in Jesus Christ. And if you haven't received the Holy Ghost, then Jesus Christ isn't in you yet. Okay, And there are many of you who are waiting for the promise of the Holy Ghost. And I'm not speaking this against you. I'm saying this to encourage you. You can receive the promise of the Father right now. Blessed be the name of the Lord. You can receive the Holy Ghost. Whether you've been baptized before or not, you can receive the Holy Ghost right now by faith. Believing the promise of God, going to Him in prayer, and worshiping Him, and receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost. And when you have been born of water and of the Spirit, then you're in Christ, and Christ is in you. And the body of sin has been crucified, because your old spiritual body has been nailed to the cross with Jesus Christ, and you are a new creature. Remember that verse of the scripture, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature? It doesn't say if any man has been born again. It says if any man be in Christ. In Christ. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. All things are become new. There are many of you who have been born again. You've been born by this word. You love this word. And you were lied to in the past. And you were told that you were saved just by believing or by accepting Jesus Christ into your heart. You were told that baptism doesn't save you. Please pardon my rude neighbors. Um, you were told that baptism doesn't save you, but that it's only an outward expression of an inward change, or that it's only a public profession of your faith. And so you haven't obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ, and so you're not in Christ. And so old things have not passed away yet, and you can't say that your body is nailed to the cross with Christ yet, because you haven't been buried with him in baptism. And this is what this passage of Scripture is talking about. Paul is teaching the church at Rome about when they were baptized and about how to recognize the fact that because they were baptized into Jesus Christ, they are now dead. They have been baptized into his death, and therefore they are no more slaves to sin, and they have the power to say no to sin, and that's what they should be doing, and that's what they must do if they expect to inherit the kingdom of God. Praise the Lord. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Henceforth is a word that means from that time and into the future, indefinitely, forever. Henceforth. Henceforth means beginning at a specific period in time and going indefinitely into the future without stopping. That's what henceforth means, from this time forth. Henceforth that henceforth we should not serve sin. You see? Don't you know? Let me read another verse to you later on in the chapter. It says um, in verse 13, Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God, as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. And in verse 16, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey? whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. See, if you're a sinner, then you're the servant of sin. This is why Jesus said, He that committeth sin is the servant of sin. You see? But whom the Son sets free is free indeed. And so if you're freed from sin, then you're not a sinner anymore. You're a saint. Okay? Do you, can you still sin? Yes, you can still sin if you want to. And there's temptation all around you, and you, you will probably wind up sinning here and there you'll probably wind up making a mistake, which is why John wrote what he wrote in 1 John. Okay? Um, who, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Praise the Lord. So if you're a saint, that doesn't mean that, you, that it's not possible for you to sin anymore. 
And it doesn't mean that you're guaranteed that you will never sin again. What it means is that your old man is crucified with Christ so that you can live in newness of life, that henceforth you should not serve sin. See, a sinner is a servant of sin, someone who sins every day. If you can't go 24 hours without sinning, then you are a servant of sin. But if you have been delivered from your sins by the gospel of Christ, and the body of sin has been destroyed from you, and now you're in Christ so you're a new creature, and old things are passed away and all things are become new, then you are free from the power of sin. So you don't have to live in sin anymore. And when temptation comes to you, and it will still come to you, probably even more so now. No, probably about it. It will come to you even more so now than it did in the past. And the Bible says there is no temptation that hath taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who, who will also provide a way of escape, okay, so that we may, uh, so that we may be able to bear it. 1 Corinthians 10.13 so, yes, temptation will come to you, even more so now that you're a Christian. But you have the power to bear it. You have the power to overcome it. You are dead with Christ and alive unto God. Dead unto sin and alive unto God. You know, a long time ago, a pastor was preaching a sermon in a, in a particular congregation that I was attending, and he put a, he had a plastic chair, and he put it on the ground in front of him, on its side, you know, the plastic chair. He put it on his side, and he pretended to offer the chair money. Here's some money, chair. Here's some hookers over here. Or look at that. There's a Las Vegas show. Here's some drugs. Whatever. And, you know, he offered the, the chair all these things, and the chair didn't move. And he said, why isn't the chair accepting all these things? Because the chair is dead. The chair is dead. You can't offer these things to a chair because the chair can't see those things. The chair doesn't desire those things. And so the chair is not going to get up and, and, and try to get those things because the chair is dead. And so it is that we who are in Jesus Christ, are dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. We, we are no longer servants of sin. We don't have to serve sin anymore because of the chains have been broken. We have been free. We've been made free so that we can say no when sin knocks on our door. So that we can say like the Lord said, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written. And then we speak the word of God concerning whatever manner of temptation has come against us, and we overcome it, and then we keep moving forward. And if we make a mistake, then we, get our, we confess our sins to God, and we get up and we keep moving forward. See, that's how a saint enters into the kingdom of God. And if you haven't been born of water and of the Spirit yet, then you're not yet a saint. And I don't say these things to demean or belittle your experience with God if you've been born again. Maybe you've been born again for years and decades. Praise God. Now it's time. It's, it's the appointed time from God because you're listening to this message for you to hear and under, understand and obey the gospel of Jesus Christ so that you can be saved from your sins. And there are many of you out there who are saying, Brother Clinton, who are you to say I'm not saved? And, you know, I accepted Jesus Christ and all this stuff, and I know that I'm saved. I know that I'm saved, and you can't tell me any different. Well, hey, your blood be upon your own head, my friend. I'm not going to argue with you about it. I'm here to give you the gospel of Jesus Christ. And right here in these first few verses of Romans chapter 6, the gospel of Jesus Christ is described so wonderfully by Paul, the apostle of Christ, who terminated in verse 7 by saying, For he that is dead is freed from sin. You see, if you're dead, then you're freed from sin. If you can say to the devil when he comes to you to tempt you with sin, you're going to have to take that sin, devil, to the body on the cross because that's where it is. You see, don't bother with me anymore because I'm dead unto sin and I'm alive unto God through Jesus Christ my Lord. So get thee behind me, Satan, because I have work to do. I must be about my father's business. You see, when the devil comes to you with the hookers and with the drugs and with the money or with the fancy job or with the fancy car or whatever it is that, that attracted you in time past and caused you to live as a servant unto sin in time past, when he comes to you with those things now that you are dead and buried and risen from the dead in Jesus Christ, born of water and of the Spirit, those things don't affect you anymore because you're not interested in those things anymore because you can see the kingdom of God. You see? And you desire those things that are above. You have set your heart on those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. You see? Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world, saith the Scripture. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, it's not of the Father. 
but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. And that's the desire of your heart if you're in Jesus Christ and he's in you. Praise the Lord. If you've been saved from your sins, and therefore your body is nailed to the body on the, is nailed to the cross in the body of Jesus Christ. And so therefore it can't be tempted with sin. It can't be forced to sin. Now it can be tempted and, and, and you can give in if you're weak and you give in, but it can't what I mean to say is that you you can't you can't tempt a dead body. In that sense, you can't be tempted to to the degree that you're forced to give in to the sin like you used to before you obeyed the gospel of Christ. And so there are many of you who are hearing this message maybe for the first time and you're saying, wow, Brother Clinton, I've been raised up all my life in this church or that church and I've been taught all my life that I was saved and now I can see by the word of God that I haven't been saved yet, but I want to be saved and I believe the word of God and I'm not ashamed to admit that I've been wrong because I don't want to wind up in hell just because my pride was so great and I wouldn't admit that I was wrong. So I want to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. Write to me. My email address is right below in the information box. Sword of the Valiant Ones at gmail.com. Write to me. Introduce yourself to me. Tell me your name. Tell me a little bit about yourself. Tell me why you want to obey the gospel of Christ that, so that I can know that you understand it. And tell me what city you're in. And I will be happy to do my best to try to find a man of God who is near you who can meet with you and baptize you according to the gospel of Jesus Christ. I don't have a church for you to go to, my friend. I don't have a church building for you to go to. I don't have an organization for you to become a member of. I'm just one man preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. But God has given me a worldwide ministry, and I know many men of God in many cities all throughout the world who are ready and waiting for me to write to them and say there's a brother or a sister near you who needs to be baptized in the name of the Lord. And they will say, yes, sir, I'm ready to go. Praise the Lord. This is how the Church of Jesus Christ operates. See, the Church of Jesus Christ doesn't have a building that we meet in two times a week and keep it locked up the rest of the week. The Church of Jesus Christ doesn't have a title on the door. We're called by the name of Jesus Christ. We're baptized in His name, we're filled with His Spirit, and we do His commandments. And He said unto us, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. This is what our Lord Jesus Christ commanded us, and this is what we do. And this is what I am here to do for you, to serve you in the gospel of Jesus Christ. If God has given you light and understanding and you have understood the gospel this day, Blessed be the name of the Lord. This is Brother Clinton. I'm out for now. Peace.